Hi, welcome to Essential IT and Security Skills. I'm Charles Redmond, Master Trainer, here to guide you through the essentials that you are gonna need to land the job that you are looking for. In this series, we're gonna talk about essential PC skills. I'm gonna walk you through everything from software to hardware. Most people know me as a cybersecurity expert. Well, I couldn't have gotten there without learning the basics first. That's what this series is gonna do. And then we'll move on in some later series with some more advanced concepts and techniques. But remember, it all starts with the basics. It starts right here, the essential PC skills. In this segment, we're gonna talk about how to troubleshoot Windows. You'll learn to troubleshoot some common Windows boot problems, troubleshoot the Windows GUI, and troubleshoot Windows application problems. First, we'll look at the failure to boot. Windows failing to boot can be caused by a multitude of issues. We're going to start with hardware or a configuration issue. So some of the symptoms that you have a hardware configuration problem is a blank screen or an error message displayed. Strange sounds or smells coming from the computer itself all point to a hardware issue you'll need to further troubleshoot and possibly repair or replace the defective device. This is an error message you never want to see. This failure occurs in the moments between the time post ends and the loading of the Windows screen appears. For Windows XP to start loading the main operating system, the critical system files, NetLoader, NetDetect, and boot INI must reside in the root directory of C, and the boot INI file must point to the Windows boot files. A common error message when one or more of these files are missing are no boot device present or NetLoader bad or missing or invalid boot INI. If you get one of these error messages, you have three possibilities to get back up and running. First, try to attempt a repair. If that fails, try to restore a backup of Windows. If either one of those fail, your only recourse is to rebuild the system. To attempt to repair using the recovery console, you'll need your boot installation CD. You'll be prompted with three options at the initial screen, either set up Windows XP, repair using recovery console, or quit setup. At this point, you're gonna press R to start the recovery console. Once the recovery console starts, follow the instructions for logging onto a Windows installation on your computer. If there's only one installation of XP on your computer, simply type the number one at the prompt. You'll then continue using the recovery console commands to repair the problems and solve issues. Here's a list of the available commands available to you within the recovery console. You can also use the recovery console to manually restore registries, stop problem services, and rebuild partitions. The recovery console also works great for fixing our three problem issues like repairing the master boot record, reinstalling the boot INI files, and rebuilding boot INI. When you see no boot device present, that generally means a bad boot sector. You can fix this error by using the fix MBR command to fix the master boot record. When you see the error netloader bad or missing, that generally means that you're missing some system files. You can copy these files directly from the source CD or DVD back to the system within the recovery console. If the boot INI file is gone or corrupt, you'll run this command from the recovery console, boot CFG space backslash rebuild. If you're able to fix your problem from the recovery console, be sure to make a thorough backup as soon as possible. If, however, you have good backups that are available to you, you can attempt to restore to an earlier working copy of Windows. For instance, if you use the Automated System Recovery or ASR backup, 
this will restore your system to a previously installed state. But you should only use this as a last resort. You will lose everything on the system that was installed or added after the date you created the ASR disk. And if all else fails, you'll have to rebuild the system. You could simply reboot the Windows CD-ROM and install right on top of the existing system, but that's usually not an optimal solution. Most OEM systems come with a recovery CD. The recovery CD is usually a CD-ROM that you boot to and run. The recovery partition is a hidden partition on the hard drive that you can activate at boot by holding down a key combination specific to that manufacturer of that system. A failure to boot in Windows Vista and Windows 7, there are two critical boot files that risk corruption. They are the boot manager and the BCD both of which you can fix with one tool. It's called the BCD Edit. You can use this tool in the Windows recovery environment. With Windows Vista, Microsoft upgraded the installation environment from the 16-bit text mode environment used in the previous versions like Windows XP and enabled the Windows installation process to go to a full graphical presentation. Microsoft calls this installation environment the Windows pre-installation environment or WinPE. With WinPE, you can boot directly to the Windows DVD. This loads a limited function graphical operating system that contains both troubleshooting and diagnostic tools. When you access Windows PE and opt for the troubleshooting and repair features, you open a special set of tools called the Windows Recovery Environment or WinRE. The Windows Recovery Environment not only replaces the recovery console, it by far improves it. WinRE includes an impressive and powerful set of both automated and manual utilities that collectively diagnose and fix all but the most serious of Windows boot problems. In Windows 7, you can access WinRE in three ways. First, you can boot from the Windows installation media. Second, you can use the repair your computer option on the advanced boot options menu, usually by pressing F8. Third, you can create a system repair disk before you have the problems. This is probably the best idea because when we have a problem, your hard drive is probably not going to be accessible. Using Windows RE, you have five options. The Startup Repair serves as a one-stop do-it-all option, including repairing a corrupted registry. It repairs critical system and driver files, runs the equivalent of the Recovery Console's Fix Boot or Fix MBR. It will roll back any non-working drivers. It will uninstall any incompatible service packs and patches. It will run the check disk and run memory tests to check your RAM. In Windows 7, the startup repair starts rather automatically if your system detects a boot problem. System Restore uses restore points to go back in time when your computer worked properly. And System Image Recovery, or in Windows Vista, it was called Windows Complete PC Restore, uses a backup image to restore your system after a catastrophe. The Windows Memory Diagnostic Tool will test your RAM. When you click the Windows Memory Diagnostic Tool link from the main WinRE screen, it prompts you to restart now and check for problems. Or check for problems the next time I start the computer. It restarts and tests memory under three possible options, basic, standard, and extended. 
Depending on how much time you have, choosing these three options will completely depend on how much time you want to take and how aggressive you want to be. In Windows 7 and Windows Vista, you also have the option within WinRE to issue command prompts. You can use commands like bootrec that will repair the master boot record, boot sector, and BC edit to view and edit the BCD store, and easy BCD, which is an included third party tool that is easier to use. Now let's talk about what to do when you have a failure to load the GUI. Most common are device driver problems that will stop the Windows GUI from loading. The Windows blue screen at death will tell you the name of the file that caused the problem and usually suggest a recommended action. However, blue screen of death problems due to device drivers almost always occur immediately after you've installed the device and rebooted. The first thing you should do is take out the installed device and then reboot and see if that fixes the problem. The second indication of a device problem that will present itself at the start of the GUI is your screen will freeze up. The Windows startup screen just stays there and you never get a chance to log on. If this happens, try one of the advanced startup options. Remember, the registry files load every time the computer boots. Another issue that can cause your GUI not to load is a bad registry entry. Remember, the registry files load every time the computer boots. If Windows attempts to load a bad registry, these errors may show up again as a blue screen of death. And it'll give you a textural error that says registry file failure or Windows could not start. To solve this problem, you'll need to restore to a good registry copy. The best way to do this is the last known good configuration boot. If that fails, you can restore to an earlier version of the registry through the recovery console in Windows XP or through Windows RE in Windows Vista and Windows 7. Here's a list of commands that you'll need to replace the registry in Windows XP. You'll need to boot from a Windows installation CD, get to the recovery console, and type these commands to restore the registry. The method of replacing the registry in Windows 7 and Windows Vista is a little bit different. Windows Vista and Windows 7 keep a regular backup of the registry handy in case you need to overwrite a corrupt registry. By default, the regidle backup task runs every 10 days. So that should be as far back as you would lose if you replace the current registry with the automatically backed up files. You can find the backed up registry files in Windows, System32, Config, Reg Back. To replace the registry, again, you'll need to boot from a Windows DVD and access Windows RE and get the command prompt shell. Next, you'll need to run the reg command to bring up the reg prompt. From there, you'll have numerous commands to choose from. The simplest is probably the copy command. Just copy the files to the location of the main registry files. They're located up one level in the tree under the config folder. If Windows fails to start up, you can use the Windows Advanced Startup options. To get to this menu, restart the computer and press F8. To get to this menu, restart the computer and press F8 after the post message, but before the Windows logo screen. Windows XP startup options are a bit different from Windows Vistas and Windows 7. Here you'll have the option to start in safe mode. 
Once in safe mode, you can use the device manager to enable or disable trouble devices. However, in safe mode, there is no safety or repair feature in any version of Windows that makes the operating systems boot into safe mode automatically. To configure the system to boot into safe mode automatically, it has to be done in msconfig. Once in safe mode, you do have several options to choose from. You can enter safe mode with networking or safe mode with command prompt. You will enable all the services necessary for network support. Entering safe mode with command prompt loads the command prompt or the command.exe program as the shell to the operating system after you log on, rather than loading the GUI itself. This is a handy option to remember if the desktop does not display at all. Some other advanced startup options include enabling boot logging. This is available again in all Windows versions. It enables Windows to start normally, but it creates a log file of the drivers as they load into memory. That file is named netbootlog.txt and is saved to the root C folder. In Windows XP, you have the option of enabling VGA mode. In Windows 7 and Windows Vista, this is called Enable Low Resolution Mode. It starts Windows normally again, but loads only the default VGA driver. If this mode solves your problem, you have a bad driver. Or it may mean that you're using the correct video driver, but it's configured incorrectly. Next you have Last Known Good Configuration. This option is available in all Windows versions. This is the option that you should try when Windows startup fails immediately after installing a new driver. It really only specifically applies to new device drivers that cause failures on reboot. And next you'll have Directory Services Restore Mode. Again, this is available in all Windows versions. It applies only to an Active Directory domain controller. Next, you have Debugging Mode. Again, available in all Windows versions, it will start Windows in Kernel Debug Mode. And next, you have Disable Automatic Restart on System Failure. Again, this is available with all Windows versions. It stops the computer from rebooting on stop errors and gives you the opportunity to write down the error so you can try to find a fix for it. In Windows Vista and Windows 7, you have the option to disable driver signature enforcement. If you're using an older driver to connect to your hard drive controller or some other low-level feature, you must use this option to get Windows to load the driver. And of course, you have the option to start Windows normally. This will start the Windows environment normally, or at least try to, without rebooting. The Reboot option performs a soft reboot of the computer. Or you could select Return to the OS Choices menu. Again, this is available with all versions of Windows, and it returns you to the Operating System Choices menu from which you can select the operating system to load. Windows also offers you a variety of troubleshooting tools in the Event Viewer. In Windows XP, the Event Viewer is in the Administrative Tools applet in the Control Panel and has three selections, Application, Security, and System. The Application section stores events specific to applications, and there are three types of events recorded, whether they're errors, warnings, or just informational. The security section records events called audits. These will have anything to do with the security of your PC, such as the number of logon events. All audits are listed as either successful or failed. The system section is similar to the application section in that you have errors, warnings, or informational. The event viewer will let you click on the link to take you to the online help and support center at Microsoft.com. The software will report your error, check the online database, and attempt to come back with a detailed explanation.
With Windows 7 and Windows Vista, it adds an easy to use interface in the event viewer itself. You still have four main bars that appear in the center pane. You have the overview, the summary of administrative events, recently viewed nodes, and the log summary. The summary of administrative events breaks down the events into different levels, critical, error, warning, information, audit success, and audit failure. You can click on any of these events to see a dialog box describing that event in detail. Microsoft refers to these as views. Views filter existing logs, making them great for custom reports using beginning and end times, the level of errors, and several other options. The logs in Windows 7 still have the same limitations that logs in earlier versions of Windows have. They have the same maximum size, a location, and behavior that occurs when they get too big, such as overwrite the log or make an error entry. Sometimes you can have problems with auto-loading programs. When one of the auto-loading programs doesn't start properly, you'll need to go in and shut it off. You can use the system configuration utility to temporarily stop programs from auto-loading. If you want to make the program stop forever, you'll need to go into the program, find a load on startup option, and then turn it off. Another issue that you can have is when critical services fail to load. Each service has a startup type, automatic, manual, or disabled. To work with the system services, you'll need to go to Control Panel, then navigate to Administrative Tools, and then Services. Once there, you can verify the service that you need is running or not and turn it on. The Windows Task Manager enables you to see all applications or programs currently running or to close an application that has stopped working properly. If for whatever reason you can't use the GUI version, you can always go into the command line and type the command task kill to find the names of process IDs of all the running processes. You can then run task kill to end any process either by file name or process ID. Sometimes you'll find that system files are the culprit. You'll use the system file checker to check and replace a number of critical files, including the all-important DLL cache. If you find you need to restore the Windows system, you'll use the system restore from the Windows recovery environment, or you can use restore points from within Windows. Starting with Windows Vista, the Problem Reports and Solutions Control Panel applet lists all Windows error reporting issues. You will also be able to view your firewall and anti-malware status here. In Windows 7, the same reports are available except they're now in the Action Center. It provides a one-page data aggregation of event messages, warnings, and maintenance messages. The Action Center will only compile information from trusted utilities like the Event Viewer, Windows Update, Windows Firewall, and the UAC. Also in the Action Center, you'll find links to the most common tools like Performance Information and Tools and Backup and Restore. When you select Performance Information and Tools, it really doesn't fix anything. It just provides a comparison using the Windows Experience Index. Windows bases this on five components, your processor, the amount of RAM, your graphics and gaming graphics, and your primary hard disk space. Each component generates a subscore. These values range from one to 5.9. For Windows Vista, these values range from 1 to 5.9 for Windows Vista and 1 to 7.9 for Windows 7.
Next, we'll look at some application problems. Almost all Windows programs come with some form of installer. If you insert a software disk, for instance, Windows knows to look for a text file called autorun.inf. That tells it which file to run off of that disk. Usually, it's the setup.exe. However, if you download the application versus having a physical software disk, you'll need to double click it to start the installation. With most installation issues, a problem with Windows prevents programs from installing. Usually it's the lack of some other program that the application needs so it can operate correctly. A prime example of this is needing the Microsoft.NET framework. In most cases, if .NET is missing, the application should try to install it at the same time that it is installed, but this may or may not happen. These types of errors usually require you to go online and do some web searches using the application name to find the error. If you find an application hasn't installed correctly, the single biggest problem that we find with uninstalling is that people try to uninstall without the required administrative privileges. If you try to uninstall and get an error, log back on as the administrator and you should be fine. You can simply right click on most installation menu options on the programs menu and select run as administrator to switch to administrative privileges. As Windows versions have changed over time, some older programs have difficulty running in the more recent Windows environments. Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Windows 7 all provide for different forms of compatibility modes to support older applications. In Windows XP, it handles compatibility issues with the Compatibility tab. Simply right-click on the executable file and then click Properties. You'll have the option to run in 256 colors, run in 640 x 480 screen resolution, or disable visual themes. In Windows Vista and Windows 7, you have some other improvements to the compatibility tab. Both add more recent operating system options to the compatibility mode drop down menu. Here you see that you can select all the way back to Windows 95 and Windows 98 and Windows ME, all the way to the more recent Windows 7. The newer compatibility tab also adds some new options. You have the option to disable desktop composition and disable display scaling on high DPI settings. This was primarily added because many programs with large fonts would look really bizarre if resized. Here you'll also find the ability to run the program as the administrator and change settings for all users. This button applies compatibility changes made to the program to every user account on the machine. Otherwise, the settings are only for the current user. If you need to make things 100% compatible with Windows XP and you have Windows 7 installed on your system, you can download Windows XP Mode. Windows XP Mode is nothing more than a pre-made Windows XP Service Pack 3 virtual machine that runs under Microsoft's virtualization program, Windows Virtual PC. It's important to remember that applications may rely on other files, in particular DLL files. Sometimes the application installer will bring specially formatted versions of a common DLL or other files to Windows overriding the previous versions. However, later applications might look for the earlier version of that DLL and then fail if it's not found. The usual fix for this issue is to perform an internet search for the missing DLL. 
Sometimes the culprit is error-prone code that causes the application to crash, even causes the operating system to crash. Some of the symptoms caused by some of these programs are the computer locking up or unexpectedly shutting down. The system might spontaneously shut down and then restart. That kind of improper shutdown can cause problems, especially to open files and folders. There are some cases where the program will actually run, but the overall performance is degraded. This could point to a hardware or driver issue, especially if the computer successfully runs other programs. And quite frankly, sometimes it's just the application itself. With Windows Vista and Windows 7, Microsoft introduced a feature called System Protection. This feature is powered by Volume Shadow Copy Services. It's a feature that was introduced in Windows XP and used with Net Backup. VSS enables the operating system to make backups of any file, even the one in use. In Windows Vista and Windows 7, VSS is also used by System Protection enabling access to previous versions of any data file or folder. However, to make use of this service, you first must make sure that system protection is enabled. To do this, go to the system protection tab in the system properties dialog box. It should be running by default. There you have it, it's pretty simple. Remember, everything starts with the basics. Once you have these understood, everything gets a whole lot easier. If you have any questions or even just a comment, feel free to leave them below and I do read each and every one of them. I'll see you next time.